Hey folks, how's it going? I had a request uh, a little while ago for someone, uh, someone asked if I could uh, do a video on OSI. So I figured I would uh, take some time and uh, do some research. I know a lot of people who are OSI, but uh, I wanna do a video on OSI. I'm gonna talk about the mission of what the OSI does, some ways that you could become an OSI agent, some of the bases you can get stationed at. I'll talk about some of the specialties. There's, there's different uh, specialties you can, um, you can get into once you become an OSI agent. I'll talk about some examples of what the OSI has done and show you a website where you can look at the, the docket of the air cases they have throughout the whole Air Force, which is kind of interesting. The OSI is kind of like, it gets a bad rap in the uh, Air Force active duty community. There's kind of a, a running joke where they're always around and uh, to hide and catch you doing something you're not supposed to do. Like if your friend is talking to you and, and uh, talking about some potentially illegal things you may have done, you must be like, hey, you're not OSI, are you? Or nice try, OSI. You know, that, that sort of thing. Like they're, they could be undercover trying to bust you. So lots of uh, memes out there about that. It's pretty funny. Um, what they actually do for the most part is OSI does investigations on Air Force bases of Air Force personnel. An Air Force base has police, which are the security forces. They are gonna pull people over, respond to calls around the base, that, that sort of thing, emergency calls. But if there's an, uh, an accusation or a potential crime that has been committed that's more serious, I guess you would say, than, uh, than a minor infraction, that's gonna fall into the realm of the OSI. Kind of like a police department would have detectives and um, and like patrolmen. Well, OSI is like the detectives. If there is an assault, rape, murder, theft, burglary, things like that, those are all things that are going to go be investigated by the OSI. So that is kind of like just a quick snapshot of what they do, but they actually, OSI actually is responsible for a lot more than that as well. They also have a counterterrorism mission which uh, which uh, which actually puts them into some really dangerous situations overseas. We were in Afghanistan for 20 years and uh, and there was OSI agents there talking to locals, trying to see if there was any kind of threat against the deployed forces in that region. But the commander of the unit will either be a civilian OSI agent or an officer OSI agent. On that note, you can also have civilians in OSI. In fact, uh, that's a good retirement job for some people. So you've been in the Air Force for a while, you either separate or you retire, and you were an OSI agent. Well, that'd be an easy job for you to roll into as a civilian is to become an OSI agent right after you got out. An OSI unit is comprised of all special agents. One of the special agents will be a commander. Now with these OSI agents, you don't know by looking at them if they are officers or if they're enlisted because they do not wear a rank from day to day. They wear civilian clothes, and in fact, even when they wear their OCPs, it will say like, and uh, it'll say like special agent somewhere on there. I mean, they could have their rank on their OCPs. I've, I've seen it both ways. I had an OSI agent in a class with me and when he wore his ABUs at the time, it just said special agent on them. And, uh, and so we all knew he was a, he was an OSI agent. He didn't wear a rank at all. And then I also saw a lieutenant in a different training. She wore her, her lieutenant rank. Like she didn't want people to know that she was in OSI, which is kind of funny. Anyway, the reason that is, is because they don't, they don't want to be any kind of a rank dynamics when uh, an OSI agent is talking to someone about a crime. If a senior airman or a staff sergeant is talking to a colonel about a crime they may have committed, they don't want to feel intimidated by them and they don't want the colonel to feel like they can intimidate them. So there's no rank issues there at all. The OSI agent is just, doesn't have a rank. For pay, they have a rank but for their investigations, they do not. Okay, so how do you become an OSI agent? So if you are going the enlisted route, you cannot become an OSI agent right off the get-go, right from the start. You will have to do whatever job you've been assigned and then cross-train. Some people think, well, security forces will be the best job to be in to transfer to OSI. Uh, I can't say that that's true or not because there are a lot of other skills that the OSI might need besides just law enforcement. Like if you are a cyber a cyber person, you have a job that's, if you're familiar with network intrusion, computers, forensic kind of uh, computer stuff, then you would also be an asset to the OSI. There is a specialty that specifically looks 
into the cyber area of crime. All right, so you can get this job by cross-training if you're enlisted. We've got that established. If you are an officer, so if you're an ROTC or you're in the Air Force Academy about to become an officer, you can actually apply to be an OSI agent prior to your graduation and become an OSI agent right off the get-go when you're a second lieutenant. It's a very competitive job to get in the Air Force right out of college, so um, you're gonna have to be the best at pretty much everything to, to get that. I've known two cadets who have become OSI agents. I'm not sure you can become OSI through OTS, Officer Training School, just because there's such a short time period there. The uh, the Academy and the and Air Force ROTC have like a four year time span where you're in the program. So that gives you plenty of time to apply. You need at least a year to go through to the application. Uh, and some of the things that are gonna help you out to become an OSI agent through ROTC specifically, and probably the Academy, or um, languages, if you're fluent in a in a in, in demand language for, for the OSI, that would be good. You need to be like the cadet the cadet wing commander always helps. You need to be getting straight A's. I mean, you need to do everything the best to be competitive. They also typically will do a internship with the police department, and that, that helps out as well. But very competitive, and I've only seen two two folks get it. Four applied and two got it. So two of the cadets did not get OSI and two did. So anyway, you can become an OSI agent right out of college if you're gonna be an officer. And OSI actually has about 2,000 people in it, Air Force wide. So if you think the Air Force has 300 and some thousand people and 2,000 of those are OSI agents, it tells you that not a lot of people are OSI agents. They only, put, they only will get new people in by about maybe 100 per year something like that. So they're not really adding to their, their um, ranks very, very largely. So it's a very competitive job to get. And for training, now for training, you're gonna be trained at Glencoe, Georgia, which is also where the uh, US Marshals train. And they're gonna learn, It's uh, you're gonna obviously gonna do some PT. You always, everything Air Force P training related, you gotta do some PT. So you're doing that, exercising a lot, you'll learn how to do interrogation techniques, how uh, do you arrest folks, hand-to-hand um, -hand combat, weapons training, things like that, and uh, investigative methods so that you can do your job well and, and conduct an investigation. And when you're done with that, there's a whole year where you're on probation, where uh, you, you don't, you're not like the lead in the case. You're just uh, trying to learn, make sure you know the job well before you actually are able to do it on your own. All right, so where can you be stationed as an OSI agent? Well, you can be stationed at any base, because pretty much any base will have an OSI detachment. Now, also one important thing to note is that the OSI unit does not report to that base commander, they report to their headquarters. So that way, again, there's no kind of, there's no way that a wing commander at a base can put their thumb on the scale for a certain person being investigated because the OSI on that unit is not in their chain of command. They report to the Inspector General of the Air Force. Every base has a detachment where they will do investigations. They could be going undercover. I knew a guy who was an Air Force agent. Uh, he was kind of a bigger guy, kind of stocky. He grew his hair out, got a beard, and he was actually in, uh, in the community undercover with a biker gang looking at drugs in the community. So undercover is definitely a thing that they do. They also go around the base to look at locations where airmen should not be at. There is a restricted business list where you as an airman on an air force base are not allowed to go to they say it's because of your own safety uh, so it's either in which is going to be true it's either going to be your own safety or somewhere where there's prostitution going on or drug use it's either for your own safety or somewhere where there is illegal stuff going on and you shouldn't be there anyway so they will have a restricted uh business list places you can't go in the community so uh, a couple examples of some cases that i've seen Fraud. I, I saw. I went to uh, actually went to a case where um, an airman was fraudulently filing travel vouchers, where he didn't actually go anywhere, but he was filing travel vouchers. That was an interesting case. I actually sat in on that one a little bit because I was uh, bored that day. Any kind of drug use, they could be doing stings. I know in Minot Air Force Base there was some officers 
selling drugs to e to each other. Or I shouldn't say to each other. One guy was kind of selling drugs to the other officers and uh, there was a big bust that went on. They kind of had to infiltrate that. So that's those are the two big things are uh, like drugs and fraud. If there's anyone who's doing business with the Air Force and they're being fraudulent, the they could be turned in and the OSI will investigate that. And if you are curious about other OSI cases, the Air Force has a docket online on the webpage that I can put up here and I can put in the notes as well. You can browse that at your leisure. Anyone from any rank in the Air Force, from Airman Basic all the way up to General could be on here showing up what they're doing in their court martials. It's pretty much all court martial cases. So if your case isn't going to court martial, then it might not be on here. So this is the Air Force docket. So overall, OSI is a, is a great job to have. I know it's a really sought after job in the Air Force. People uh, want to cross train into it. And you can cross train into it as an officer as well. I mentioned you can go into it direct as an officer, but you just have to go to their website, OSI, and, uh, and look at their cross train information there. And there will be mass messages through AFPC when they're, when they're open to having people cross train either officer or enlisted into the OSI. It's a fulfilling job. You know you're catching bad guys, but also no one's gonna, no one likes you because you're OSI and they don't want to talk to you or tell you about anything that they're doing. It could be a lonely job, but it is uh, a good job. And when you get out, you can work all sorts of places with the FBI. Speaking of the FBI, the OSI actually will partner with the FBI when they need to on certain criminal cases as well. So they have a good relationship with the local community and the FBI. So that's my uh, take on, on that. So I wish you all good luck. And if you want to be an OSI agent in college and you're in college ROTC right now, just do be, you need to probably be the number one at everything. And then that'll give you a pretty good chance of being selected because uh, it's a very competitive process. All right, guys, uh, have a good day and I'm out.